Well, good morning. Uh, I'm Joe Donito, and I'm teaching an adult Sunday school on Essential Truths of the Christian Faith, which is a book by R.C. Sproul, um, who was a theologian of the 20th and 21st century. And um, we're going to be doing a lesson today on the Sabbath, a sometimes misunderstood concept. And this is lesson 24 in the book. You may have different books um, if you have one, um, but the pages might be different, but the, the lessons are still the same. So this is um, lesson 84 on the Sabbath. And uh, we're coming to you from um, Lutz, Florida. This is Cornerstone Presbyterian Church. And as I always say every week, if you are uh, looking for a church, um, it's right off of Van Dyke. And uh, the address is 17520 Marsh Road, 17520 Marsh Road in Lutz. Uh, but let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer before we start. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, uh, we ask that you continue to protect us. It looks like there's rain today. Uh, there's a storm in the uh, in Mexico. Anyway, uh, please keep it away from us, Lord. Uh, as we still have two months of uh, the hurricane season here in Florida. Uh, continue to protect us from illness, especially um, the one that's on everybody's mind, the COVID. And um, we just ask that you would be um, with us in a special way. Continue to pour out your blessings. Uh, be with the first family that just came down with uh, the COVID. And um, anybody else who gets it and... Um, let us uh, consider uh, statements made by Sproul and the Bible about uh, the Sabbath today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, I'm going to be starting reading uh, from their lesson here uh, by Sproul. The sanctity of the Sabbath was instituted at creation that early. Wow. After his creative work of six days, God rested on the seventh day and hallowed it, blessed it. Uh, by hallowing it, God set the seventh day apart. He consecrated it as holy. Uh, proper observation or observance of the Sabbath was one of the Ten Commandments given at Mount Sinai. It is important to remember that its institution was an integral part of the creation covenant in the Old Testament. Violation of the Sabbath was a capital offense. That means death. Okay, if you were caught violating the Sabbath, uh, you were killed. I, I had a professor that um, insisted that we read aloud this passage, and um, it was about two guys gathering sticks on the Sabbath. And so, um, I mean, most of us in the class had read the Bible all the way through, but it's just not necessarily a story you remember. And here's the story is that, you know, these two guys are gathering sticks on the Sabbath and Moses orders the people to, you know, to bring them together and, and then they, they gather them together and they stone them to death. Okay. You're not supposed to gather sticks on the Sabbath. That's how severe the thing was, okay? Um, you almost don't believe the story, but it's in there, okay? So anyway, um, also I'd like to mention, you know I'm a math teacher. Uh, uh, there's nothing natural about the number seven in the sense that you're not gonna see lights come on every seventh day, okay, or anything like that. The only way we get the number seven is directly from the Bible. Okay, we get it from the Bible. The Bible says on the seventh day he rested. And that's how we count our weeks. Not just the Jews, not just the Hebrews, which, by the way, is a pretty small group when you think about it. Um, in other words, it's not like the Jews were the biggest people group. And they said, let's count seven and we'll make our weeks seven days long. They weren't. But the Bible says seven. Um, what I mean by that is, uh, you know, the sun comes up, the sun goes down. You can, you can count that. 
you can count the number of days uh, and so on and you can count the year by you know 365 days you know as it goes around the whole cycle and so on but um, there isn't really anything natural about the seven we get that from God God gave it to us and said look one in seven you need to rest one in seven that's what Sabbath means Sabbath means seven or seventh okay all right let's keep going the word Sabbath means seventh that is why some insist that Saturday is the only proper day to celebrate the Sabbath and that is illegitimate to uh, celebrate on Sunday that's not true but there's a group of people um, and I'm not meaning to insult anyone or whatever uh, a cousin of mine became one uh, it's called the Seventh-day Adventists. How many of you have ever heard of the Seventh-day Adventists? And the Seventh-day Adventists, um, they celebrate on Saturday, not on Sunday. But it goes, it's actually deeper than that. For example, a lot of them will say, well, we're not saying that you guys are going to hell for celebrating on Sunday, but, okay, they think it's a big deal. They think it's a huge deal. In fact, recently I saw a video on YouTube and um, I thought the guy was tending that way. He didn't realize, he didn't reveal that he was a Seventh-day Adventist till the end of the video, but you know, started saying all kinds of things against all of us churches that worship on Sunday. Okay, if you wanna know how Sunday came about, it's very simple. Um, Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday. Okay, and we call that the Lord's Day. But there, there's a more practical answer. If you remember the apostles, the, um, the apostles after Jesus um, was um, uh, crucified uh, and then raised from the dead, they worshiped together, but the temple was still there. Do you seriously think that the apostles were going to stop going to the temple because Jesus was crucified and raised from the dead? That's the temple that Jesus went to. That's the temple that Jesus um, talked about. It's the temple that Jesus got so angry that they were selling and buying and selling things that it was a, a shame. It was a blasphemy against his father, against God. So if the temple was still there, they were going to the temple and you went to the temple on Saturday. So when did they have the Christian worship? They had it on Sunday, the day he was raised. So in the beginning of the church, the apostles went with the Jews on Saturday and then they had their own service in secret on Sunday. Okay, so keep that in mind. All right. Um, Oh, okay, I lost my place. Where was I? Um, oh, there's a question? No. Oh, however, historic Christianity has always or observed Sunday as the Sabbath because it, in the New Testament, it's the Lord's Day, the day of Christ's resurrection. The principle of Sabbath, one in seven, remains, but it's the first day of the week instead of the last. In other words, the Jews, the Old Covenant, was the last day of the week. And why did they do it? Because God did it, right? On the seventh day, he rested. That's God, right? But now, Jesus is raised on the first day of the week. And so, and most of our calendars, aren't most of our calendars, don't they start with Sunday? It goes Sunday through Saturday, right? That's, that's what we're used to. The weekly Sabbath has been in perpetual effect since creation and was observed by the apostles. In fact, um, you may think that this isn't true, but the Jews claim they've been counting seven since the beginning. Okay, so they know what day is Sunday. Okay, and what day is Saturday. Questions of proper Sabbath observ observance continue to be debated among theologians. Most argue that the Sabbath includes a mandate to rest from all but necessary commerce or labor, or let's put emergency Okay, obviously, if, if you call 911, you're expecting help on, on the Sabbath. And the Bible says that's okay. All right. The Sabbath is also a time for corporate worship and special attention to the study of God's Word. It is a special time of rejoicing in Christ's resurrection and in the hope 
of our Sabbath rest in heaven. Now, here, here's uh, what happens a lot. And I want to be careful because I do believe these people who talk this way are Christian. And some of them are my brothers and sisters that I have dealt with. Uh, but for example, you'll get somebody who says, um, we have to follow nine of the Ten Commandments. The Sabbath has been abrogated by Jesus himself. No, this is not true. There are Ten Commandments. You still have to follow Ten Commandments. Okay, so what they're arguing, and they, and they can make persuasive arguments, my Lord, uh, for example, they'll say, well, you know, the Sabbath that the commandment was about was the Saturday Sabbath, and now we're on Sunday, it's really the Lord's Day, so that commandment, you don't have to follow it. Um, I believe, and I think I've said this before in previous lectures, uh, I believe that they're just using that as an excuse not to go to church, okay? And once again, I'm not talking about the COVID, please. I understand a lot of us can't get out or, or you know, have to stay home. Um, but, you know, I, I, I often have said this. I am not a great mercy person. I haven't spent a lot of time with people who are ill or in homebound or whatever. But the ones that I have, if you ask them, would you like to go to church? You know what they say? Yes. Homebound people would love to be able to go to church. They're at home because they can't go to church, right? All right. So um, uh, that's different. That's uh, what we call in the Reformed faith providentially hindered. The person is hindered by providence. And that's it. What, do you think, what are you going to do? And now you got the COVID and you got all this other stuff that's going on. I mean, in the beginning, people thought they would never reopen the churches. Okay, disagreement centers on the role of recreation and works of mercy. Some regard recreation as a worldly violation of the Sabbath, while others insist it is an important part of rest and refreshment. The Bible nowhere explicitly promotes or prohibits recreation on the Sabbath, though the meaning of pleasure in Isaiah 58, 13 may suggest that it is prohibited. Okay, um, it can be translated as pleasure or business. So then the question becomes, you know, are you doing business on the Sabbath? Are you going through your books, paying your bills, etc.? Are you going out to shop, buy groceries, etc.? All these uh, other things. Um, and, um, uh, you know, that's not exactly recreation or rest, but... Um, uh, I, I had to take an uh, exception, um, um, and my exception, because in all the paperwork I filled out because I'm trying to get licensed to preach, um, I said that I do believe recreation on the Sabbath is okay, that, uh, and I also believe resting is okay. There are people who believe that, that taking a nap on the Sabbath is disrespectful. I don't. I think you can take a nap on the Sabbath. That's okay. Um, I also uh, believe that um, if you wanted to throw a ball around or something like that, that would be okay too. Uh, but again, I'm telling you that's not the norm. The norm is for, to abstain from everything um, on the Sabbath. A less strident debate focuses on the issue of works of mercy. In other words, what do you do for people on the Sabbath? And of course, there's that famous situation where Jesus found the man with the withered hand in the temple and he healed him on the Sabbath. And they got all upset at him because you healed on the Sabbath. Couldn't you come back tomorrow and do it, you know? See, it seems kind of silly a little bit, but... Um, many appeal to Jesus' example of special ministry on the Sabbath as an implicit command for Christians to be actively engaged in works of mercy on the Sabbath, such as visiting the sick. Others contend that Jesus' example is uh, lawful and good to be so engaged, but that what is allowed is not necessarily required. There's a difference between allowed and required. That such works of mercy are not limited to the Sabbath is clear. In other words, Jesus didn't only do it on the Sabbath. He didn't only do it to get the Pharisees upset. Okay, that isn't the reason. Um, although I have to admit, the first time I saw 
There is uh, several movies, but there's an excellent movie about the Gospel of John, and it is three hours long, and it is word for word. It's an unusual translation, but it's three hours long, word for word, and they and the, they go through the whole thing. And um, I never realized. <laughs> I always thought the Gospel of John was the nicest and most um, what's the word um, gentle of the Gospels. But um, seeing it read word for word without stop going through three hours, um, Jesus did a lot of things to get the authorities upset. <laughs> That's all I can say. And you almost would have to say he did it on purpose. He, he, he basically uh, um, uh, spoke uh, to them in that way. Um, and again, you normally don't uh, consider the Gospel of John to be that, but... Anyway, all right, before we get to the summary, let's go to some of the uh, scriptures. Uh, I'd like to thank Chris. Chris, every week, uh, makes me a sheet of all of the scriptures so I don't have to spend a lot of time up here uh, shifting back and forth in the Bible. And I believe this is the ESV, is it not, uh, Chris? Yes, it is. Yes. There's a mistake on your sheet, so just skip over the Isaiah part. Skip over Isaiah. Okay, yeah. fine. All right. Um, uh, well, I'll use I'll use a Bible for that then, or phone. <laughs> I'll use the phone for that. Okay. Here's some uh, supporting passages, because remember, let's let's not forget. As great as uh, R.C. Sproul was, he was one of my favorite theologians. I got to meet him. I got to be in class. I I, I didn't get to take a class from him. Um, he had left RTS by the time I got there, but I will say uh, the man was a great teacher. Uh, he had a way of talking that he could get the message across and you were you did not feel stupid and you also understood. And then what I really like about Sproul is you can give a book about by R.C. Sproul, like for example, Chosen by God, to a friend of yours who disagrees with you theologically and they'll still be your friend after they read that book. In other words, the, the book is not going to insult them. It's not going to make them feel like they're the small or anything like that. So he had a great, he had a great ministry. Um, but he's not Bible. Sproul is not the Bible, right? He's not canon. So here's where he gets his authority. We're going to start with Genesis 2, 1 through 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array, by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Okay. Uh, Exodus 20, 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female slave. So you can't hire somebody to do the work. It's like, oh, I know, I'll rest and I'll hire someone. No, okay. Nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your town. So you can't hire a foreigner and say, hey, you do the work. No. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. But on the seventh day he rested. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Wow. Now that's from the Ten Commandments. It's also repeated again in Deuteronomy. Same thing. Um, and um, that's, that's pretty clear. Okay, that's pretty clear. All right, now uh, Isaiah 58. Thirteen and fourteen. If you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure, on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable. If you honor it, not going your own ways, 
or seeking your own pleasure or taking or talking idly, sorry, talking idly, then you shall delight in the Lord. And I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Okay. And um, my version of the ESV has these little things that you can press on the phone and it'll tell you it's pleasure or business. Okay. So again, um, my father, uh, when I was a kid, if you didn't get all your homework done by Saturday, you didn't get to do it on Sunday. Too bad. You had to face the consequences on Monday at church, at school. Um, so you had to get all your homework done before, um, before Sunday. And that's just, uh, I don't know where he got that from, but he definitely uh, did that. Okay, we're continuing with Chris's sheet now. Um, this is Matthew 12. Uh, verses 1 through 14, and uh, the title is, Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. Okay, so Matthew 12, starting at verse 1. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some of the heads of grain and eat them. That's called gleaning, by the way, gleaning. When the Pharisees saw this, oh, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. He answered, haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread. They called it the show bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that the priests on Sabbath duty in the temple, desecrate the Sabbath, and yet are innocent. That means, in other words, <laughs> when the minister or the priest preaches on Sunday, he's breaking the Sabbath, but it's lawful. It's okay to do that. See what, see what I'm saying? This is what Jesus is saying. And it was true in the day of the Jews also. I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the innocent, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. All right, that's Jesus himself saying that. The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Going on from that place, he went into the synagogue. Now you understand, the synagogue is not the same as the temple. The temple is where all the sacrifices are. There was only one temple. There were many synagogues, okay? And a man with a shriveled hand was there looking for some reason to bring charges against Jesus, they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Right, this is a trap, right? He said to them, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? And by the way, they would, okay? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out and it was completely restored, just as sound as his other hand. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. Wow. And elsewhere, Jesus says the Sabbath was um, uh, made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Okay, Acts 20, verse 7. On the first day of the week... We came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people and because he intended to leave the next day, kept on talking until midnight. That's when they did the Christian service on the first day of the week. Okay. Um, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 through 2. Um, now, about the collection for the Lord's people, do what I told the Galatian church to churches to do on the first day of the week that's again sunday right each one of us should set aside some money in keeping with your income that's the tithe right saving it up so that when i come no collections will have to be made and then last he has revelation 110 on the lord's day i was in the spirit this is john speaking and i heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet Okay, 
So the Lord's Day, Sunday, is it legitimate? Every, every year I have a Jew who comes to me, some Jew who will say, why did the Christians change the Sabbath to Sunday? And the answer is the same. <laughs> it's always the same answer. Because they started all of, I mean, I know it might be hard to understand this, but in the beginning, right, when, when Jesus was there, and Jesus preached, and then he was crucified and raised from the dead. All the Christians were Jews. In the beginning, they were all Jews. So the Romans had a hard time with this because they looked at them, they were dressed all the same, and it was like, but they're Jews. No, they're Jews, and then there's the Nazarene Jews, the ones that follow the, Nazar the Nazarene, the ones that follow Christ. But the Romans didn't see that. They just saw all Jews, okay? Of course, then, they were reaching out to non-Jews. They were reaching out to Gentiles, the Christians. But in the beginning, you know, they were all Jews. So these people, the Sabbath was a big deal. They went to the temple. The temple was still there till, according to history, 70 AD. Then it was destroyed by the Romans because the Romans had had enough with the Jews, and they destroyed the temple. Once they destroyed the temple, that actually freed the Christian movement because the Christians wouldn't leave. The apostles wouldn't leave Jerusalem in that area because the temple was still there. Once the temple was destroyed, then they could go anywhere. They could go to Spain. They could go any, they could leave, all right? And then there was only one service, and that service was on Sunday. Okay, so keep that in mind. All right, uh, he does an excellent summary. Here's the summary. Number one, the Sabbath was instituted at creation and is still in force. Please don't let anyone tell you that you, there's only nine commandments. Don't, tell, don't let anybody tell you that. There are ten commandments. There's still ten commandments. Number two, Sabbath means seventh. It refers to a cycle of one day in seven. Okay. Number three, the early church celebrated the Sabbath on the Lord's Day, moving the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday, the first day of the week. Why? Because Jesus was raised from the dead, the resurrection, on Sunday. The Sabbath requires cessation from regular labor, except necessary labor or emergency labor, and the assembly of saints in corporate worship. And number five, there is disagreement over the propriety of recreation and the necessity of works of mercy on the Sabbath. And uh, I think that's it. Uh, next week's lesson is going to be... Um, 98. What? 98. 98, which is uh, the return of Christ. Okay, and we're still continuing. Uh, I think this is great. We have, there's over 101 lessons in this book, and we have only scratched the surface. I think we've only done like 18 or something. So we are going to continue. Uh, we'll go back to the beginning or something like that, but just uh, keep it. And if you have a chance, buy this book. It's a fantastic book. It's a great resource. It's called Essential Truths of the Christian Faith. Um, let me close this in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much. Uh, for this class, for this church. Uh, we thank you for uh, the pastor who is going to be coming soon um, and uh, that, that he would be not only welcomed and blessed, uh, but that he'd have an easy time getting here and um, uh, would be able to minister to um, open-minded and, and open-hearted people. And Lord, please uh, bring this COVID to an end so that we can eventually get back uh, to uh, some sense of the normal living that we are used to. We ask this in Jesus' name.